Blessed good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is the feast day of St. Peter and St. Paul, today 29th June. So we will hear a little more about them later on in the service. I pray. Open my lips that my mouth may proclaim your praise. Blessed be the Lord God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Let us pray. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. That our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your spirit may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. I'm worshiping before the throne of God. For the Lord, He is good, and His love endures forever. So we enter in.
Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the whole unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 106 Reading from verses 1 through 18. Praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare all his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory in your heritage. Both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have committed iniquity, have done wickedly. Our ancestors when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wonderful works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, so that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. He led them through the deep as though a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and delivered them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. But they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. They were jealous of Moses in the camp and of Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Datan and covered the faction of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their camp. The flame burned up the wicked. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. First reading is taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verses 1 through 21. The Israelites set out and camped in the plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Moab was in great dread of the people because they were so numerous. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midan, This horde will now lick up all that is around us, as an ox licks up the grass of the field. Now Balak, son of Zippor, 
was king of Moab at that time. He sent messengers to Balaam son of Beor at the Pithor, which is on the Euphrates in the land of Amal, to summon him saying, A people has come out of Egypt. They have spread over the face of the earth and they have settled next to me. Come now, curse this people for me since they are stronger than I. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that whomever you bless is blessed and whomever you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midan departed with the fees for divination in their land. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. He said to them, Stay here tonight and I will bring back word to you, just as the Lord speaks to me. So the officials of Moab stayed with Balaam. God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, King Balak, son of Zippor, of Moab, has sent me this message. A people has come out of Egypt who has spread over the face of the earth. Now come curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the officials of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the officials of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent officials more numerous and more distinguished than these. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak son of Zippor, Do not let anything hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Although Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. You remain here, as the others did, so I may learn what more the Lord may say to me. That night God came to Balaam and said to him, If the men have come to summon you, get up and go with them. But do only what I tell you to do. So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the officials of Moab. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, reading from verses 12 through 22. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. 
he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? He left them, went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. In the morning, when he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the side of the road, he went to it and found nothing at all on it but leaves. Then he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. Whatever you ask for in prayer, with faith, you will receive. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk today about prophetic blessings and curses. Uh, I want to talk particularly about the power of the prophetic town. It's comforting to know that we have priests and prophets in the church and we call upon them to bless our homes and our cars and to pray over us in birthdays and anniversaries. It feels good to know that we have available um, someone whose one word of blessing can significantly impact our lives uh, for the better. Uh, it's good to know that we have those ministries available in the church. Well, King Balak, king of Moab, felt the same way about his prophet Balaam. He knew that he will call upon him when he needed to, and if he paid him just enough money, he can use him to curse Israel. And so that was his plan. He believed in the power of the tongue. He believed that, as Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, that life and death is in the power of the town. He understood that words are not just wind. He understood, as according to Proverbs as well, that life and death are in the power of the town, and the proverb goes on to say that they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. In other words, we'll be made to eat our words. Our words form our world. What we say, is very powerful and very important. Words are not just wind. And so it's possible that the state of our lives today is because of that which we spoke or should have spoken. Not only does life and death lie in the power of the tongue, but also blessings and curses. Uh, the prophetic blessing is very powerful and the second chronicles chapter 20 verse 20 says believe in the lord your god and you shall be established believe in his prophets and you shall prosper in our gospel reading in matthew chapter 21 we see jesus cursing the fig tree he spoke one word and the tree withered the disciples questioned him concerning how was this possible and he says, it is only possible 
through the word of faith. So blessing and curses are in the tongue. Not only blessings and curses on life and death are in the tongue, but binding and loosing are in the tongue. Uh, the, there's binding and loosing in the prophetic word. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 19, Jesus said to his disciple Peter, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, Encyclopedia Biblica says that in Jewish terminology, to bind and to loose mean to forbid with indisputable authority or to permit by indisputable authority. Now, St. Peter, formerly Simon, a fisherman, and indeed, he became a recognized leader in the church, and he became a symbol of the church universal. And he, his ministry was particularly to the Jews, but... Peter, in his representing the church, and the church being the body of Christ, was given Christ's power on earth to declare what is right from what is wrong, what is lawful versus what is unlawful, who is forgiven and who is not. It's not that uh, the truth concerning these things, you know, that which is right or wrong, or that which, you know, who's forgiven from who is not forgiven, it's not that this power resided in Peter or even in the church, the prophetic tongue in itself. This power really resides in Christ. And, and so Christ has given this power to the church so that we have the authority to make declarations. Now, there are those who will challenge this authority as to whether we have the right to make such declarations concerning what is true versus what is not. And so God has um, endorsed our ministry with signs and wonders and the gifts of the church. So if there's any question concerning the truth or the veracity of what we say as a church, uh, the veracity of our declarations, God supports that with all the powers of heaven. Therefore, whatever a man or woman of God decrees and declares shall be so. In other words, we've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, what are the keys to the kingdom? The keys to the kingdom is a metaphorical term referring to King David's treasure house, the keys to King David's treasure house. Whoever has this position has a very responsible position of having access to the kingdom's treasures with the authority of the king. Revelation 3, 7 says that Jesus Christ is the one with the keys of David. And it is he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. In Matthew chapter 16, we see Jesus telling Peter that he has the keys and here's why. Peter had made a very spirit-filled revelationary statement concerning who Christ was. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is saying, I named you Peter which means little rock. But what you just said seems like a, a little rock, like an insignificant little statement, but it is the Petra. You are Petros. This statement is the Petra or huge boulder, foundation stone upon which I will build the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And so, this declaration of Peter's is the foundation of the gospel message. Uh, Christ is the son of the living God. It's the one truth that grants us access to all of the kingdom's treasure. The good news is that God has opened for us a way through Christ. Because God has opened for us access to his storehouse through Christ. Christ give this good news to Peter and to the church. We are the ones by whom we can permit access to God's grace versus no access to God's grace. The church is the key. And so Peter was the first to use these keys 
when he opened the door to Christianity to the Jews in Diaspora in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. He also used these keys um, for the Samaritans who were closed off to the gospel uh, in, chapter, in Acts chapter 8. He used those keys again in Acts chapter 10 when he opened the door to Christianity to the Gentile world when he, opened, when he visited Cornelius' house. So the keys is a great responsibility the church holds to make declarations and to open ways of forgiveness for the world. Now, it is at this point that I know you have some serious questions. The questions that come to mind are these. What if the prophet of God does not speak as to the oracles of God? What if they're hypocrites and they do not represent God in their presentation? What about the words that they speak? What will become of them? And what will become of us who follow such words? What will become of us? What if they lead us astray? How could God put such great responsibility in the hands of frail humanity? Well, first of all, this is a good question because Jesus says the wheat and the tares must grow together. So he means he has a plan. First of all, he's not happy about incompetent or greedy or otherwise ungodly prophets that they exist in the church. But since the wheat and tares must grow together, he will allow it. But be, be known that judgment will come. Jesus, as the angel of the Lord, appeared to Balaam and stopped him in his tracks when he became aware of his mercenary ways. Jesus walked into the temple and overturned the tables and disrupted the money changing and mercenary activities of the chief priests and scribes. Uh, Jesus um, expressed his anger uh, and at the fig tree. Now, what does the fig tree have to do with it? Well, it wasn't misplaced aggression. The fig tree symbolized Israel. And when you see the tree with leaves, it means that it must have fruit on it. So Jesus expected to have fruit. When he got to the tree, it had no fruit. And the fig tree being a symbol of Israel, usually, uh, as he cursed the fig tree, he was in symbolic fashion cursing the, the Israelite temple ministry. And he was saying, you will never more produce from this day forward. That production will now go to the church. St. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 2, reads like this. There used to be false prophets among God's people, just as you will have some false prophets among you today. They will secretly introduce things that are wrong, teachings that will cause God's people to be lost. They will even refuse to accept Jesus, the master who brought their freedom. So they will bring quick destruction on themselves. Those false teachers only want your money. So in their greed, they will exploit you by telling you lies. Their judgment spoken against them long ago is still coming and their ruin is certain. Secondly, not only that God will judge false prophets, but he will save those who can be saved. See, nothing will be allowed to stop the growth of God's church. The gates of hell and death will not prevail against it. So, so many prophets, for example, may just be immature. And, uh, and many others will just be acting out of a moment of weakness. So what does God do? He tries to save them. And what about you who followed them and got misled? God will find a way to save you because God is about salvation. So Peter goes on. God saved Lot from these cities. Lot was a good and righteous man. But because he lived among evil people every day, Day after day, his good heart was hurt by the evil things he saw and heard. 
So the Lord knows how to save those who serve him. When troubles come from trial, testing, and temptation, however, God will hold evil people and punish them while they wait for their punishment on Judgment Day. Now, here's an example. The church failed miserably to include Gentiles. And when they did so, God raised up the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul became the Apostle to the Gentiles. Now, he was not one of the twelve. He was, in their minds, an outsider, even though he was a Pharisee. And he knew the law well, and he was persecuting the church. God stopped him on the road of Damascus and called him into ministry. And Paul became apostle to the Gentiles. The apostle, um, the apostle Paul became recognized as a founder of the local church, while Peter was recognized as a founder of the universal church. So in Paul's letters, Paul was writing to home churches, and we still have those letters to help inform us concerning doctrine today. So leadership, when they fail, God steps in. Here's another example. The apostle Peter himself found himself in a state of hypocrisy. He was eating with the Gentiles, and as soon as his Jewish colleagues and friends came in, he got up and, and led a, a group of others with him to leave the Gentiles' table. This was very embarrassing. So Paul had to confront him publicly about this. So the momentary failure of the establishment or the, the, the priests or the prophets in the church will not destroy the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all individual members, living stones that make up the holy temple. While there is the church universal, the church universal is made up of the local church and the local church is made up of you and I. We are the church. And when the church as an organization fail and when the symbols of the organization disappoint us and let us down, let us not lump this with the whole church. You are the church. I am the church. We must speak prophetically. So Jesus tells them, if you want to curse fig trees and you want to move mountains, speak, but speak in prayer. Do so prayerfully. When the house of prayer failed, the temple, he says, you can pray and hear from God and speak for God because you and I are the church. We must watch our words. Let our words form our world. Let our words create that which God wants to create and destroy that which God wants to destroy. We are the church. You and I are the church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you will help us to explore it. Help us to listen to you. Help us to pray to you. Help us to speak only what you would have us to speak. Help us to say only what you would have us to say. Let us not become engaged in showmanship and show business like and, and mercenary behavior like uh, the Pharisees and scribes and the chief priests and like Balaam. Let our prophecy, let our words, let our lifestyle, dear God, truly reflect your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Apostles' Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. Almighty God, you've built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in your safety to this new day. Preserve us in your mighty power that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Prayer of Dedication Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our path, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let's bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're now in peace to love and serve in the name of Christ. <laughs>